Right. So it's a lot of fun to be here. I met you in, uh, at a Stanford event in, Ju in June, and you said, well, maybe I should come here. I said, you know, gee, oh, Vienna? Sure. You know, I know people in Vienna. I could have a great old time in Vienna for a weekend. So that's why I'm here. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to escape family and dogs and everything for a weekend and be with friends. It's great. So what I do is I start companies. Okay? And I mean start. I tend to take them from an idea, a very techie idea usually, to something that rolls, that moves, that has 50, 60 employees and maybe a turnover of 10 or 15 or 20 million euros. Then I figure that somebody else needs to take over because at that point it's all about quality systems and management structures and decision structures. Um, and yes, I have gotten the ISO 1345 quality certification in a med tech startup I did, but it almost killed me. And I'm not going to do it again, okay? <laughs> Let somebody else do this. And there are a lot of people who are, there are many more people who are good at taking something that actually works and growing it. And there are people who are good at doing what I do, which is taking an idea and turning it into a computer, into a company. Another thing I do is that what I do is really techy stuff. At the moment, I'm doing a satellite system, satellite terminals for the new generation of satellites, and an AI system for personal training. Uh, I'm probably looking at doing a blockchain thing. It uh, looks like it. Uh, money isn't signed yet, but it looks like it. Uh, and that's a blockchain for uh, an interior internal function for various banks. Okay, so it's heavy tech. Okay. Deep tech, it's called in Sweden, uh, to, as a difference of the, of the people doing an app for a social network for um, dog owners, which is a very successful startup in Sweden. Another one for people who like to fish, that's another very successful startup. Um, those are great. I, I've done one or two of those, some of something similar, but that's not what I really like to do as much. Okay, Can do them, but not like them so much. The ones I've done well are these. Klarna, which is a unicorn, they do payment systems for e-shops. Uh, they're worth a few billion dollars now. I'm not really sure how many. Lensway is contact lenses on the net. They're the number one in the world on contact lenses on the net. Blue Tail was lots of fun. Uh, started with 11 others. We were 12 founders. Uh, sold it after 18 months for $150 million. Uh, these are the ones we're doing at the moment. We, that's, that's mostly my husband because they needed a new entirely new business model okay and, and i'm doing i'm in the board this is caroline's it's 3d scanning for perfectly fitting shoes uh, they're in trouble because the biggest chinese shoe really retailer wants 30,000 of their units and so far they've really only delivered 60. okay so it's like um we have a slight scaling thing majig to do now oops mom do you know anybody who can like produce things in masses. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do actually, here we go. Uh, and SatCube, which is um, these satellite terminals, fancy satellite terminals for the high throughput satellites. I have also done Toby, which is <coughs> eye steering for computers. So you can actually steer a computer with your eyes. I did the handicap stuff, which is you can, if you stare long enough at a point on the screen, it's click, and therefore you can steer a computer by clicking at it which means you can get a computer to, you can write your memoirs, you can, if you have bad cerebral palsy, you can keep up in class. So you can actually get university degrees, even with bad cerebral palsy, because there's nothing wrong with your brain. You just can't control, uh, which is really neat. I love that. Tecla Network I sold in March. That's uh, makes L it's TCP optimization for making LT networks faster. Kirsten Wallard is my f husband's company that did mostly revenue management, which means what product will actually make the most money and what it should it be like. So for instance, there was a, when fast trains were introduced into Sweden, they were gonna make them real cheap. And, and my husband said, you know, gee, you don't have to do that because you're actually competing with flights, domestic flights. And if you make them comfortable and total time, including check-in and getting patted down by somebody you don't know, uh, is, <laughs> is about the same for being uncomfortable on a train or very uncomfortable on a plane. Well, maybe you can take about the same amount of money as for a plane, and that worked well. 
Okay, so he does that sort of thing. Um, so of these, it's basically me doing most of them, and these are more of the ones I've done. Uh, in decreasing order of success, the top ones were back here, really wonderful. Down here, the founders fell apart within a month of my investment. Well done, Jane, you know. Uh, this one, Apple uh, took over, uh, it was a, a legal platform, so you could actually, people who developed casual games could sell them easily to mobile network operators, and Apple came in with a much better idea, which is just sell them directly to the people involved and, f and, and bypass the mobile operators. The mobile operators are still angry about this, but it works better than ours did. Uh, anyway, so these things, it, what we've noticed, what I've noticed is the more I actually work in a company, honest to goodness, day-to-day -day work, the better the company goes. And I figure that it's because I've done so many computers, so many startups, that I'm actually decent at a bunch of stuff. I'm not great, but I can install a CRM system, and I do know approximately how it should work. Uh, I do know how to stand in a trade show and sell stuff. I do know something about contracting. So I can do a lot of useful things for a startup. And if I'm there <coughs> reliably a lot of the time, one of the gang, you, making the coffee, being at the office first sometimes, uh, being available on the phone, always on the chats, well, then they could ask me stuff, which they wouldn't ask a board member or an investor because it's diddly squat stuff that they really need to get done by themselves. But if I'm, one of the, if I'm somebody reliably working there, then, then I'm useful and I can do that. And that stuff that they need done gets done, and that helps the startup. So what do I actually do? What do we actually do? Uh, first of all, there's context. We know a whole bunch of people. I'm a middle-aged woman. I know people probably from 40 to 90, somewhere there. Uh, the ones who are a little bit younger than 40, I don't generally know as well. My daughter does. She's 26. She's also a good entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur, also very techy. Uh, and my husband does quite a bit of value in pricing, okay? What does the product have to do? Can we put this into a subscription-based model so you get money every month? Uh, how much are people actually willing to pay? Mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff. We are, all three of us, quite decent at sales, okay? And contracting. This is often what is missing in techie startups, is sales. The business stuff, the contracting, the sales, and we do that. We understand your technology well enough. We're not going to do the development for you, but we are going to understand it and sell it to customers. All right, so having done my first um, startup when I was eight, which is now 40, what, 45 years ago? No, 46 years ago. <laughs> uh, and the latest one, I was just yesterday working on it. Actually, I got a phone call from the entrepreneur that I need to return. Um, so constantly on starting companies. My husband as well. And I do coach startups in Sweden as, as part of my pay it forward. So I do coach startups. Uh, so this is, I mean, I've, I'm in this constantly, right? And then, of course, people get money. I think that money is actually fairly cheap nowadays. There's an, off, since most of the developed world has had a, it, it's, Sweden at least, and Switzerland, I don't know about Austria, but if you loan money to the government, you're going to get less back in nominal terms after 10 years or 20 years, less back. Basically, you, you pay the government to keep your money. So people looking for returns will generally, uh, they're going to more and more risky projects, and there is nothing higher risk than this, but it can be a great return. Uh, and so we're getting more and more money, stupid money, into the startups. Uh, but it is available. It's, it's a resource. It's not free. It's not all that easy to get, but it's a lot easier than you think. If you learn how to pitch, and learning to pitch is possible, <laughs> even for scientists, uh, then, then you can actually get money. Okay, so what do we do more? We join techie startups, right? So generally, there's a lot of technical skill, lots and then we balance it up with business goal. Uh, so what we look for when we invest is a great founding group and then 
one product that really solves some problem. And we want a growing market, okay? Reason being, if a, if a market is shrinking, if you're, for instance, selling into mobile network operators like I did with Teclo Networks, well, mobile network operators are having trouble, right? The prices are going down. They're under a lot of pressure to fire people because people like Free in France can do a whole me mobile network operator on about 70 middle-class jobs. And Swisscom, at least, had around 10,000 middle-class jobs. So Swisscom is under some pressure to cut their cut their workforce. <laughs> Little pressure. So it's hard to sell. If you're selling to Swisscom, then they don't want to buy because they're, everybody's losing their jobs anyway. All right. So you guys are basically my kind of people. You're techies. Actually, that's the reason to come here, too, because you're my, okay. I might not look it. I might look like an UFO from your point of view, but uh, I actually do like you guys. Uh, and what most of the people I know very well who are techies tend to do is to not communicate. A little bit worse in communication than you ought to be. So you're not talking, you have this idea about a product and you think it all the way through yourself. And maybe even you develop it before you talk to customers. And that's just a god-awful mistake because you're going, you are going to guarantee develop the wrong product. If you don't talk to the people paying for it or using it, then it will be wrong. Uh, one of my first companies, Blue Tail, we were, um, as I said, 11 incredible computer science geniuses and me, right? And they had this idea about, remember, this is, this is clustering technology for the internet so we could, we could move stuff. Uh, if, if a customer came in to, or a, somebody logged on to a website and that server went down, we could move things to the next web, next machine. Very exciting stuff 16 years ago. Yeah, it was great 16 years ago. Now it's just so common. But anyway, what they thought was, well, actually having to press the refresh button, that's a bad thing. So we should basically do a whole bunch of mirroring so that when one, web, when one machine goes down, absolutely everything, it's completely transparent, which is a lovely research project 16 years ago. They were just all excited. But I said, well, maybe let's talk to a few customers and see what they think. And I coached them and said to the guy who's really charming and kind of quiet, that, right, you're, me and the talkative techie, we're going to be up here you know, doing a song and dance routine, and you're going to sit and just be kind of comfortable the way you always are, Robert, just comfortable to be with. And then you leave the meeting room last, and you talk to the guy walking beside you and say, so what's really wrong with your life? I mean, what would you really need? Okay. And Robert always got the answer. The ones of us standing in the front, we didn't, because then it was the bosses talking to the bosses. But the ones who actually knew what was going on, they were the ones talking to comfortable Robert. Right? And Robert said, what they really want is a counter. They don't know how many people are on their website at all. And you know, a counter. How long time will it take Robert to make a counter? Mm, 10 minutes, maybe, 15. <laughs> That's it. Uh, but Robert was well enough trained that he could say, not say, oh, I'll do that in 15 minutes, you idiot. He said, oh, a counter. Well, what do you actually want to count? Why do you want to count it? Okay, big open questions. And then would you be interested in buying if we had a counter in the next version in a month? <laughs> Which is, you know, many times as long. And, and the customer was really all excited about getting counters and nobody cared in the least about this fancy move everything over. Okay? And if we had put the energy into moving everything over, uh, well then we wouldn't have done all the rest of the little stuff that people actually cared about. Okay? That's one, one problem with communication. Another problem with communication is often techies will sit in their own worlds, in your own worlds, and not talk to each other about what's going on so that you won't know what's actually going on with your colleagues, okay? To fix that, I found that it's generally best to have written communication, okay? So chats. I've done Skype chats, now it's more over to Slack. So you can actually write down what's going on and it feels a bit like the water cooler. You can say, 
I can't believe it, the coffee beans are all gone again. The, I can't believe, how much coffee do you people drink? And everybody said, no, it's you, Jane, who's drinking the coffee, not us, it's you. Maybe you're right. Mm. Okay, but the coffee machines, I'm, I'm out of here for 15 minutes because I've got to go buy coffee beans because I'm not going to survive another half hour without coffee. Or something. Okay. Um, that kind of stuff goes on chat, so you get the feeling of community, right? Also, what goes on chats is, oh my God, I talked to so-and-so at this company in Israel, and would you believe they have a meeting schedule with our competitor on a Friday evening, whoops, Friday evening in Israel? Whoa, that's like Saturday evening here. They're under a lot of pressure. That sort of stuff. You can't actually write anywhere, but okay, there's an incredible pressure on this company. Interesting. And everybody should know it, because it then, and in the same way, all of the, the customer input, the, what's going on with the customers, the people who are actually developing something like to know that customers care. Right? So, chats, email, weekly meetings, okay, where you go through absolutely everything. In a startup, you need to, everything should be transparent, so you go through everything. Um, expense reports. I mean, you, they're, they're, you've got the finances, and if people want to go into the expense reports, it's all open. So everybody knows, can know exactly how much money I spent on tonight's hotel, right? Um, and then the, 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 the CRM system, which is a customer relationship. We have your customers listed in there, and then what's happened with them, and all the emails pertaining to them there. So when somebody's going to go visit or talk to that customer, then they can look through what's been promised to them and what they've been talking about and what that customer thinks is important. It only takes a minute or two to sort of scan through and say, oh, okay, they're on the uh, KU band satellite, fine, I won't talk about KU band, good, okay, and, right? So having things documented, having things written is usually good. In less techie startups, it's not quite as necessary to have everything written down. I went through this in great detail uh, last hour uh, those of you who know about this, it's called Porter's Five Forces. Um, it's really very important. You want a lot of customers. Perfect cus the perfect startup has a lot of customers who none of them pay very much. Okay? A bad startup has only a few customers who can eat you. A good startup has a lot of suppliers. Um, you can buy paper from that store or that store. You can buy pens from any of ten. Uh, computer power is available from Amazon and Microsoft and IST. Uh, and that's fine. Um, if you have, on the other hand, just a few suppliers, well then they can be very powerful and take all your profit. Uh, substitutes. Changing the iPod nanos that you used to hang around your neck not too long ago, now they're on your smartphone in your pocket, right? Nobody's, used, nobody's buying the iPod nanos, or very few are, I would say. The iPod nanos have been, su they're, they're, the smartphones have substituted for the iPod nanos and have killed the portable music player. Uh, barriers to entry and exit. Um, this is something that I consider very important in a startup, and it's very important for a techie startup. If you're doing something fantastic, you want to make sure that it's rather difficult for somebody else to see it and say, oh, good, I'll do the same thing. With more money, because I can tell it works. And we'll get in a whole bunch of really amb ambitious people with a background from McKinsey who've always wanted to do a startup but uh, don't want to actually start it. You know? <laughs> uh, okay? But so what you want to do is something that makes it difficult for them to copy you. The big barriers to entries are things that you can't have. There are things like brand value. If you're a startup, you have not got a brand. You are something that nobody recognizes. Coca-Cola has a brand. Uh, another thing you can't have is a whole lot of very valuable customer relationships. Because you're a startup, you don't have any customers, or very few. So what you need are the technical barriers, either patents, or something really complicated to develop that uh, other people can't easily do, or enough technical manpower and brain power so that it's really hard for somebody else to actually do this. Or sometimes for Lensway, for instance, which is contact lenses on the internet, sounds easy, right? But it's not, because it was at that point extremely difficult to get a hold of contact lenses for the gray market. Reason being, 
that customers, people like me who use contact lenses, we talk to ophthalmologists, somebody who prescribes what contact lens we should use, what size and shape and brand it should be. And we're going to buy only that brand, right? So the, for the people who are making contact lenses, it's important for them to be the brand that the ophthalmologist actually recommends. Because I'm not going to change from one brand to another because my ophthalmologist told me to buy that brand. And I'm just going to buy it. So the people making the lenses want the ophthalmologist to prescribe them, right? And the ophthalmologists are not going to prescribe any lenses that the people can buy from other sources because they make their profit on selling lenses, right? So they're not going to let, they're not going to, they want to have lenses that are their own unique lenses that the, uh, that the internet providers can't actually sell. So there are only five factories in the world making contact lenses. Only five. They're all the same. They're all fighting for the ophthalmologist to prescribe them. They're not going to let, they're not going to sell directly to any internet provider because then they've suddenly cut off all of their future sales. So how do you get a hold of lenses? It's a problem. You go to India where, somebody, where somebody's actually bought a little few too many lenses for a long time and gotten a, a too large an inventory and then you buy that inventory in bulk. So it's actually difficult to get the lenses. And that was the barrier to entry for Lensway. Klarna, which is the payment one, um, to start off with, they had a fantastic technical group and were very fast-footed on technical stuff. After a while, it turned out that what they had was data about who pays in time and who pays a little bit late and who will never pay. And that is valuable because then they can, for the e-shops, the, what happens with Klarna is that you customer says, I want to buy 10 blue pens from this store here, and the, and the store sends the 10 blue pens and, uh, and a bill, an invoice, to the person buying the pens. But they know that the invoice will be paid by Klarna. Right? Okay, so Klarna goes in and takes the risk. Uh, so Klarna can say yes to, because of all the data Klarna has, Klarna can say yes to more deals, more purchases than their competitors, which is a big deal for an e-shop because they want to sell as many blue pens as possible, especially if they know they're going to be paid. And if Klarna can say, we actually say yes to 20% more deals than the others do, well, that's worth something. It's really hard to compete with that. That's a barrier to entry. Rivalry is how nasty people are you know, to each other in the industry. You can be, go from all very, very nice to just god-awful. Uh, the worst of the god-awful ones are the medical ones. Watch out for the medical ones. You need to, if you're in the medical industry, you're going to do something med tech or drug discovery or anything. You need your patents. You need lawyers involved. You need your IPR down s very solidly. And you need to keep a lawyer involved all the time. Doctors are nasty. Okay? It just is. They're just terrible. Uh, and you didn't think so. It's like the pre-meds in the university, they were always sabotaging each other's experiments. Well, they stay the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay? So watch out. If you are one, watch out. Be careful. Realize that the people around you are out to get you. Okay? In other, in other uh, industries, it's really not as bad, generally. You want to be careful, but you don't have to be quite as careful. I understand that IST has a very good technology uh, outsourcing deal. Uh, you need to, if, you, if you invent in something that you want to make commercial, I think you talk to Marco or one of his colleagues, right? Uh, they know how to figure it out so that you can actually commercialize it, even if, you, even if IST has some ownership in it. You can do that. OK, so what do I do actually? One of the things I do is outsource product development, which means that some technical people come to me and said, we can do the following, it's pretty magical, and we think that big companies X, Y, Z will need this in a few years. As a matter of fact, we're pretty convinced of it. They don't have this, it's a product they, their customers will want in a few years. Okay, given that, then I can, I can uh, throw myself in twice now as CEO and say, right, 
this is a technical group. Let's make it into a product. Let's industrialize it. Let's get a few customers in, and then let's sell the company. Because the value, value of the, the product, the value of the company, is, is actually, it's actually the product when you put it into a sales channel that's actually bigger. Uh, as a small company, you actually can't sell something really key from a startup into large organizations. You can maybe do a couple sales, but other than that, you can't. The big organizations wants to buy from other big organizations. The, 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 uh, the saying is that elephants, is, elephants dance together. And you don't want to be a little mouse dancing with an elephant because things can happen. <laughs> uh, so what happens is that here we say, right, we're going to do clustering technology for internet uh, we will make it an absolutely fantastic, wonderful product with amazing technology. We'll have a group of fantastic techies doing it. We will sell it to a few, and then we will auction it off to various people who would like to buy it, and there will be an auction. And then you get lots of money for a product because you're doing something miraculous that the big companies' customers want. And if you have a little traction, then the big companies are starting to promise that they can do this thing. Right? They promise that they can do clustering technology. And they can't, and we know they can't. So we go, we, from Blue Tech, we went to all the people who were actually promising that they could do what we could do. We knew they couldn't. And we knew that the value of our company is the biggest right now because whoever buys us will be able to deliver. And nobody else will be able to deliver. And they will, so therefore, money, right? Uh, Techlo Network, something similar. Hmm? This is a reasonable thing to do from techie people. So usually we want to buy, if we can, we try to build a long-lasting company. The reason is we like long-lasting companies. It's good for the community. It's good for society. We want to make jobs and taxes and you know, make sure that we all can have a decent standard of living. So this is the thing we really want to do. It's not so damn easy. You have to have a lot of luck. But Klarna, uh, yeah, it's, these are things that have actually, we tried, the Klarna's worked, Lensway's worked, SatCube, I've only been in a few months, I think maybe it's going to work. It's feeling very, very promising. Panopka didn't work at all. Real-time data, it didn't work. It was a good idea, it was good technology. We turned into one trick pony, we didn't actually get the second product out. So we had to sell ourselves to somebody. We, we, had to, we had to pretend we were thinking about doing outsourced uh, product development instead because the second product didn't work. But this is what we're trying to do. You make a product, you think that, okay, this is the first product and this will be one of, of several. We can sort of envision the same customers and sort of similar products. We can do it. We can, because if you can sell to the same customer repeatedly, it's much easier than having to sell to new customers. We think so, think. All right, what do I do? Okay, so what is it like having a startup? The big thing to think about is actually if you are, if you have the choice of being employed or having your own company, take your own company, you will be happier. Research shows the people who have small companies are happier. Okay, why? Because what you're doing is useful. <laughs> Somebody is act, whatever you're doing is actually contributing. Somebody cares. It makes difference if you're coming to work or not. What you're doing is actually somebody cares about it. You're making somebody else's life easier. Maybe you're making many other people easier, more enjoyable. That's wonderful. It's fulfillment. And you're making your own idea into something that actually exists. That's a big deal. Building something that actually exists. It's a feeling of accomplishment. Many tech people tend to be employed at big companies. They're put into making some, some project. The project is killed by a senior manager five years later or three years later. When that happens to you a couple, three times, you're not very happy because you've lost a big chunk of your life on something that's not useful. Happens a lot. Avoid it. Make your own. Uh, we do have hierarchical frustration. Well, I 
told one of my good stories about hierarchical frustrations, but there are numbers of top managers see a different reality than the people down at the floor do. And I believe that the people down at the floor know a lot more about what's going on than the top managers do. But the top managers take decisions that you have to, as a middle manager, you have to actually defend and implement. And then the ones below that have to defend and implement. And it turns out to have just terrible consequences on, on, at the base level. And so if you're at the base level, if you're at Ericsson, Ericsson is a Swedish company. It's not doing very well at the moment, pretty much disastrously at the moment. Uh, I would say that the techies I've known, I've known with Ericsson techies for you know, 30 years now, they generally spend their lunch hours talking about internal politics. Okay? It's miserable. I think that boss so-and-so likes boss so-and-so, and therefore we should be able to get together. Our, get, our, our project won't be killed. Right? Very little conversation, even about technical stuff, and almost no conversation about customers. That is a recipe for a dead company. And it is the way most big organizations work, is that people down at the bottom spend their time worrying about what the bosses think, rather than worrying about what the customers think. If you can be your own startup, then you will think about your customers. And for a while, even your employees will think about the customers until you grow too big. And then you'll have the same problem as everybody else. Okay, and you can have money. If it goes well, then you can have more money than you can use. It's fun. Okay, it's like being on a roller coaster. Um, so yesterday, I was working for SatCube, the satellite one. Okay, yesterday. We're talking not long ago. Uh, the morning was spent negotiating a supplier's agreement with a, with a supplier that has too much power over us. Negotiations got stuck. We won't give you this. We won't give you that. Hell. Okay. So I up and suggested building a company together, a joint venture, so we can all have, it can be transparent. Right? So we will build a company together, SatCube and the supplier, and we will see if we can put together a company that will then, that in their turn will not have any powerful suppliers, so we will be able to be a, a reasonable company together. That was first way down. We're not going to get this contract, SatCube, is in terrible, terrible trouble. We are not going to make it. And then joint venture. Hey, you know, that's interesting. Yeah, maybe. Oh, my God. Maybe. Right. Yeah, maybe. And then there is an internal problem with one of the people who owns a lot of shares that, we, that is not doing his job at SatCube. So the president, the CEO, and I were sitting on the plane together discussing how to get this co-founder out of the company. That's a big, fat problem. Okay? Downer. Terrible downer. And then we talked to the, one of the other owners when we, got, when we landed in Dusseldorf. When I was on my way here, and he was on his way back to Sweden. We talked you know, from the baggage claim area, right? You won. We think maybe a joint venture. Oh, good idea. Wow. Maybe, why didn't you talk to me about that before? Because I came up with the idea in the meeting. Oh, well, it's a good idea. Maybe we should talk about it. When can we talk about it? And I say, well, how about Saturday? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Saturday. Uh, really exciting. And then his name is Marcus, too. Okay. Marcus is not doing his job. We need to do something. Ooh, yeah. Well, Marcus and I are really good friends. Mm, lovely. Right? So up and down, up and down, right? Um, yeah. Uh, the, this is what I, start, having a startup is really high energy. It's very exciting. It's adrenaline all the time. It's close to death one minute. And wow, we're going to make this amazing, fantastic thing the next minute. We're going to go into bankruptcy got two months left until bankruptcy. No, no, wait a minute. We sold the company for $150 million with two weeks left. Uh, it, it is that way, OK? And the, the excitement of it is the reason I keep on doing this over and over again, because I'm a junkie, and I need this level of excitement. 
And now I'm doing even two at a time in order to really get the, you know, it's like smoking two cigarettes at a time, right? Or, or drinking quadruple shots of espresso. It, it, it's really too bad, but there you are. You're talking to a junkie. Huh? That's us. Okay, and this is the downside risk, if it goes badly. For people like you, how long time would it honestly take to, to get a new job? And I would say for a computer science person, probably 10 minutes. For a biologist, maybe a couple weeks. If you want a good job, maybe you want to choose a few. It'll take you three weeks. Downside risk is very low. Uh, in Sweden, uh, I don't know what it's like in Austria, but in Sweden, there is a system where you get health care. So if you get sick, then you will be taken care of. Your family will be taken care of. There is no way that you're going to get cancer or diabetes and not be taken care of. It doesn't exist. Same way that all the schools are decent. So nobody pay, almost nobody pays, for fee, fa pays fees for their school. There are no fee-paying schools. Everybody's in public school, which costs nothing. So your kids, if you go badly and don't have any money for a couple months, you don't have to pull your kids out of school and turn them into some worse school. They're going to be in the same place, in the same school, with the same friends, doing the same activities, because nothing is allowed to cost anything for kids. Fine. In the same way, your pension generally is, is a certain per percentage of your salary is put into some lockbox that you're not allowed to access until you're at least 55 years old and probably later. You can't spoil that money as an entrepreneur. You can't get at it. You can't spoil it. What you can do is have too low a salary for a few years. So there's your pension contributions are lower for those couple years, but it's not going to make a huge difference to your end pension because it's only a couple years of a little bit lower salary. No big deal. Your kids will in general have an education. It's not only that the public schools are public schools and they're decent, it's also that university is free. I understand here, when you get to your level, you're actually getting paid to go to school. So your parents don't need to support you to, co to come here. It's a big deal. So there's very, there's very little downside in terms of starting a company, other than the close-to-death experiences, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, whoo, look at that down there. <laughs> okay. The upside risk is actually much worse. Believe it or not, this is a real problem. Good friend of mine, Luke, one of my co-founders, had enough money for the rest of his life when he was 26. 26, more than enough. Enough for his kids the rest of his life, should he have any. Well, hell, what are you supposed to do? So what he did, was he went on adventures. Okay, he was a fat hacker. Let's just put it clearly. He was a fat, ugly hacker. He uh, got into shape. He runs Ironmans. He's gorgeous. He bicycled across Laos with the girlfriend. Pretty exciting. He fell in love with a uh, young woman in Jordan who was uh, rather, had a conservative family. That was an adventure. He had to run for it because he was getting death threats from her family. It's a way to get some of the roller coaster excitement into life, right? <laughs> but then after a while, he said, no, actually, where do I want to live in the world? Well, I like to bicycle up mountains and swim across cold lakes, so Zurich is great. But what I want to do with my life is actually to start another company or two or three. So he started Techno Networks with us, and then he went off after a while from that and started another one. He's now 35, and he's got a couple of kids, and life is great. And he works from home, mostly because he figures that being a, young, a parent of young children, it's better to be there and enjoy them. So he is. Okay. But the what do I do now? Basically, everybody of the 20 or so, 20, 30 people I've seen and helped go through this, everybody goes on fantastic vacations. Absolutely wonderful. You know, spend six months with Aborigines in, in Australia. Or go to, go to the Arctic. Uh, mm -hmm. The men generally have another kid, at least. <laughs> Women, not so much. Uh, a lot of people get into good shape. 
And basically everybody has started another company because we've gotten a hit. This is a drug. And once you've felt this, nothing else really compares. Nothing else really compares. It is that much fun. And it is that difficult. Um, that's what I was going to say. Uh, what I generally do at this point is field questions. Um, basically ask me anything. I, I do this, right? So you, for instance. You're here. <gasps> okay, you don't have to. <laughs> you. Because you transitioned from a very different life of having a PhD or whether at Stanford and psychology. How did you get into it? What inspired you? What were the difficulties in transitioning to being able to do this well? Oh, uh, I, no, I didn't. I just had a bachelor's. Um, no, I'm... Uh, my family's all entrepreneurs, okay? My birth family's all entrepreneurs. Everybody. So that's what we talked about in dinner. Like cash flow and not enough sales and, <laughs> and such. So that's what we did. Uh, and then I fell in love with a Swedish guy and moved to Sweden. And started, I had a job, but he was starting a company. And he was making nothing. And we needed more money. We couldn't keep fruit, right? So I said, okay, we, we need more money. And what does anybody in my family do when we need more money? We start a company. That's <laughs> what we do if we need more money. Okay, so we started a company. And that one went okay, not great. Three, and I did a few of the small ones. And then he sold a company, and I didn't need to work anymore. But I do work. So, okay, what do I want? I want deep techie people. Uh, happily consume computer science, um, slow, lots of time to talk to each other. And I you know, found a group like that at Ericsson. And then it turned into Blue Tail, which was exciting again. And then I realized that, oh, hell no. I guess this is the way. Every time I do a big one, I say, oh, I'm going to retire now. But I've learned I, I, I won't. Both my parents retired at 85, so I don't think <laughs> I will for a while. Uh, both of them, I mean, my mother sold her bookstore, okay, uh, on her 85th birthday. She was still working, not full time, but a pretty hefty part time of 20 or 30, 25 hours a week at 84 and 364 days. And the day after her 85th birthday, she went out with her friends. She's thinking, okay, so what am I going to do when I'm retired? Well, I'm going to spend more time with my friends. So she went out with a group of girlfriends at 85 years plus one day and called me in the end and said, Jane, I don't want to spend my time with all these old people. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Because uh, friendships turn into sort of age segregated things often enough. And when she was working with people, well, she was working with all ages. And her customers would come in being, you know, this high holding a soccer ball. Say, and she'd say, oh, you're going to Mikey's birthday, aren't you? He wants that book. Well, you know, tell you something. He's already going to get that book. How about if you get the second one in that series? <laughs> so that, she just loved being in the bookstore. And, and she was miserable for a couple weeks being retired. And then she decided to start university courses and things. So uh, I am an entrepreneur. Uh, to transition from academia into entrepreneurship, I think you generally will need somebody a bit like me to do it, right? You need somebody who is b sales oriented. One of the questions I will ask people when trying to employ them is, um, when life is really kind of yucky and there's a lot of things to do, what do you actually do? A techie will say, I will go and code it and make it better. A person like me says, oh, I'll call a few customers, at least I can shoot the breeze, <laughs> right? You want somebody who will default to calling the customers. It's very important, because you people will generally not call the customers. Okay, That's important. The other thing that is, um, there's a lot of just little, little things, little bits of skill that you can learn from an entrepreneurship course. Uh, you can learn from having a, start a fairly vibrant startup community. I don't know if there is one around here, probably, no. There is in Berlin, they speak German. Um, there is in Stockholm, come to Stockholm. There is in London as well. Um, but, you, but actually talking to people in your same situation and saying, we have this problem, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We use capsule CRM for that, right? It's good enough, it's cheap, start there. 
<laughs> or you know, just, just these tips how to do this. Uh, there's incubators often enough which will, we will they'll give you courses in this. I, I don't know, do you, yeah, incubators. That those things to do, but you will generally need to have a diversity of skills. Another question you can ask is, given a newspaper, one of these paper ones, where do you start reading? What do you read in what order? Okay. Anybody who doesn't admit to reading the comics, don't hire them for sales. <laughs> Okay. I myself, I start with the comics, and then I'll read about the latest thing that Donald Trump did. But I will start with the comics. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, it's a tragedy. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, so, you. Me? Yeah. What, do you, what would you like to know? Are you going to start a startup? Mm. I, start. I wonder, because like you had this background from family, like mm -hmm. you already had experience in some sense, like mm -hmm. you had it in intuitively, yeah. right? I wonder how important that is, and would that already, like, is that a barrier for a random person <coughs> to start to get into this? Yeah, it's a barrier. It's, it's much easier to speak French if you learn it from the time, if you hear it when, from your mother. It is, okay? But it is not true that it is impossible oh. to learn French, okay? And French is much more difficult than entrepreneurship, by God, it's amazing. <laughs> now, you can learn, you can learn from, there's a, there's a blog uh, by a guy named Steve Blank, there's Udacity courses, uh, there's um, the Lean Startup, there's um, your incubators, there's the, the startup scene, there's a lot of places where people, basically the states, the society is trying their damnedest to get people like you, just like you, to, to have a startup. And they're doing everything. They figure that what you need is money, and they'll arrange universe. And they'll arrange that somehow. Okay. There's various. They're, they're they're trying their damnest to fix money. Right. They will also figure that you need to get the entrepreneurship skills, and so there's lots of training stuff around that. Okay. And then there's uh, you probably need some contacts, and then there's all the tech meetups and stuff. There, are people, the society is doing their darndest to to put together a support structure which will give you the knowledge and the contacts and the money and the other resources you need. I mean, I do this in Sweden. I'm, I'm a startup course person, but there is, I bet, Austria. I've, I've, I would imagine that's one of the main reasons that they've made this whole IST is they want innovation to happen around here. And if you have an idea, then they want that <coughs> to become a success, and they will do bloody much to get it to work. Thanks, <laughs>